Hello friends, welcome to another episode of the TSC Audio Project. In this episode of Shop Talk, Mike and I talk about body awareness, stability, and balance. We go off on a few tangents, but those are the main topics. This segment is sponsored by our official travel sponsor, Nanook Protective Hard Cases. Check out their badass cases at nanook.com. And it's also sponsored by TFC Shop, your online store to access shoes designed for human feet, balance beams, and foot health accessories. Check out tfc-shop.com for some wicked products. That's it for sponsors, so let's get into it. It's the TFC Audio Project. It's a collective effort. Help people understand their bodies, starting at the feet are the gateway for people to see that there's an issue. You know, a foot conversation is always a whole body conversation. Hey guys, Nick and Mike here for Shop Talk, episode number three. Today we're going to talk about balance, body awareness, and joint stability. We talk about what balance is, why people lose the ability to balance, how to train it, and why we place such a big focus on hip stability in our practice, which has happened more recently um, in the past couple of years, but uh, our, our kind of focus on the importance of balance and, and the fact that we work on it a lot more with people. Um, we're going to go over kind of why that is and what our rationale for that is. So I guess first let's start off with what is balance? You know, I think it's easy easy to look over balance as something that's really simple and something we learn in physio school, the importance of balance or standing on one leg, but it never really sunk in until we started to really nerd out on feet. And I'm sure you were probably in the same boat. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So we learned this back in physio school and it's just something that we take for granted what balance is and what we need to actually balance. So balance is the interplay of a bunch of systems that are working together to maintain your ability to stay upright on two feet for mm -hmm. humans in space. Which is pretty impressive, um, right? Like yeah. uh, we always mention that in our seminars too, it's like we can shoot uh, a car into space, but we can't make a robot that walks seamlessly and fluidly like a human, like indistinguishably from a human. And that's because even something as simple as walking is an extremely complex motion, right? It involves this interplay of, like you said, multiple systems, feedback systems to make sure that we're getting the right signals to fire the right muscles to not fall on our faces. And all we're standing on is these two little tiny things we call feet. So it's, it's complex. Yeah. If you look at the actual design of like a human and it's like, it's like almost like that's a terrible design, right? <laughs> if you looked at it, it's like, wait a minute, the balance points are these two small little things. Yeah. Whereas like the center of gravity is way above. You'd be like, you, you, you could have thought of a better design, but the fact that we can be so efficient and smooth with it, yeah. it provides other benefits uh, outside of that. But, but being able to balance and actually being able to be smooth on two feet or on one foot, mm -hmm. or even just like your main concern as a human uh, your nervous system's concern is preventing you from falling over and yeah. hurting yourself, killing yourself, whatever it is. Yeah. So you need to just, you need to be able to protect yourself by staying on your two feet. And it's something you learn as a baby. Like yeah. look how hard it is for a baby to stand for the first time. And you see the real struggle of having to process all this complex information. And exactly. you know, one of the biggest things, um, having to do with balance is your foot is your ground sensor. So if your foot is designed, um, as the main conduit to get information from the ground, where your weight is shifted, where your center of mass is, what you're standing on top of. Um, and we cover these things with a bunch of layers of foam or air. It's putting us at this automatic disadvantage. And it's, you know, we, we hate to always harp on shoes, but it really does come back to this. If your feet are your sensors to enable the right signals to go, you know, it's one, one portion, right? Exactly. Like, let's talk about the main systems involved in balance. I guess. It's so a good yeah, we'll get to, to that. Um, we'll get to the feet in a second. That would be more of the involved in proprioception. Yeah. And so picking the three feet back up from the ground. So you so got the proprioceptive, system. which is feedback from your bodies, um, from your feet or from your joints. Uh, no. so that, yeah. And proprioception is basically like, knowing where your body is in space. Yeah. So the example is like, if you're in a dark room and you bend your arm, you know that your arm is bent. If you put a blindfold on somebody and you bend their knee, they can tell you how much you bent their knee, right? Without actually looking at it. So they, you can feel, and that's from these sensors that are in each joint of the muscles body. So as well, there's sensors in muscles, there's sensors in tendons, ligaments, there's sensors in joint capsules in the skin. The skin has tons of these mechanoreceptors that can pick how up information. Crazy is it? How crazy is it? How complex our machines are. And we just, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you never look at, you look at your body as just you, right? Something that you have, but you never look at it in the context of, mm -hmm. and I've started, I really have started to shift my thinking of the body as a machine because using, uh, you know, the laws of leverage and the laws of physics and joint kinematics, like it, 
if you think of the body as a machine, it makes a lot more sense as to why things break down. Um, exactly. And it's just so, it, it's crazy. We have receptors in our skin, tendons, muscles, joint capsules. Like, that is insane how mm-hmm. well built we are and how complex we are. So if you um, looked at like the foot, for example, you're, you're getting a lot of this. And the, a lot of the studies are showing the incredible amount of information your foot picks up. And now a lot of that's the skin of the foot. So mm-hmm. you, the skin is picking up with all these mechanoreceptors on the foot. It's picking up vibration. It's picking up uh, light touch, pressure, differential, all these other things. So, again, that's what we're talking about when, when you're eliminating when you're putting padding on your on your foot you're you're decreasing the space of your foot as a sensor to work you're decreasing some of that that exists at your ankle too all the way up through other body parts as well and these are all playing a part in your overall sense of balance but your foot is a one of the biggest factors in all of that so that's a proprioceptive system that's your your body awareness relying on the sensors these these sensors built into your body the other two systems that play a big role in balance is the the visual and the vestibular system and i think um, you know, we're not claiming to be vestibular experts here. We're just trying to understand this alongside everyone else. And um, so when we look at the visual system, you know, one thing that we use a lot when we train balance in people is trying to get them to get more information from their vestibular and proprioceptive system by taking away some of the visual feedback and not necessarily um, closing your eyes because that increases the challenge significantly, but just not looking down at your feet. It's not normal to stare at your feet when you walk around. So when we train people, uh, get people working on their stability or their their um, their balance in the clinic, we make sure you're not look you're not supposed to be looking down at your feet. And just by doing that is a significant game changer for a lot of people. Yeah, because when you're not looking down at your feet, so the the, the visual system is really picking up cues for, from your environment. So it's looking at and it's doing all these things that we don't even know we're not aware of right so mm-hmm. it's picking up the angles of different objects um, objects that are moving and it's sending all this information to our brain um, and giving us a kind of a, a feedback and an example of, of how our environment is so and that helps us balance right um, so it, it's working along with the other two systems that help us balance the vestibular and the proprioception system okay and that's the, the the example that we always give is like close your eyes when you're standing on one foot mm-hmm. it's automatically way harder right For all sure. you've done is eliminate that visual feedback and it's like whoa i'm falling all over the place now um so vision is something that we take for granted as well when it comes to balance and that's why even like i notice when i'm on the slack line for instance mm-hmm. or i'm on a beam you kind of the biggest challenge when you're on a slack line at first is to like figure out where i need to look mm-hmm. so the first few times doing it is like, where do I look? Do I look at my feet? Do I look up straight up? I found that, that what I work best when I actually look kind of veer into the distance, but I look at the actual line. So I'm picking up a little bit of feedback from the line going back yeah. and forth, but oh, I'm also not, not looking down. straight down at my feet. Yeah. And I'm also not looking straight up in the distance where I don't, can't even see the line in my vision. Well, those are the two strategies I see people in clinic. When we get someone on a beam, they either look directly at their feet or they fix their gaze on one specific point. Mm-hmm. And the problem with one specific point is as soon as that gaze is broken, you walk by, you say something, they lose that one point, they lose their stability. So they're, you, you know, like you said, looking into the distance where you're aware of the whole surrounding, but you're still focusing on one kind of area. Um, I, I find, and what I'm trying to do now is actually when I'm on the stock line or the beam, I'm trying to look around and, and mm-hmm. be aware of my environment more so than just fixing my gaze in one spot. And that I find is helping me to train more body awareness because I'm not focusing on one static fixation point as much. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's like your peripheral vision is coming into play there. Your body's picking up all these little things from the environment to help you balance. But exactly, if you play around with that and you look at different places, uh, you'll always have your sweet spot where you can kind of like pick pick things up. You know your feet are right there, but you're not directly looking at them. Yeah. Sometimes you see your toes in the view. But again, that's kind of the, the visual part of the system. The, the final part would be the vestibular system. Well, just while we're on the visual too, one way that I noticed it a lot, like we went on a hike this weekend at Lustful Falls. It's a place about 45 minutes from Ottawa. And the amount of visual feedback that i use like every time mm-hmm. so lustful falls is basically a, there's portions of this where it's just all rocks all like uh mid-size kind of you know some are jagged some are smooth but there's rocks everywhere so when you're wearing uh something like a vibram on your foot you literally have to be able to see whether it's in your peripheral vision or your direct line of vision where you're going to put every foot right you have to know your foot mm-hmm. placement or else you take three times the amount of time to hike because you're feeling around with your foot so the visual system i noticed there and it's connecting the visual and proprioceptive because i have to look at a rock and yeah. basically look three steps ahead of where i'm going to put my feet because you're going down like a 30 yeah, degree right. face and not only do you have to spot where you're going to put your foot but your foot actually has to know how to get there and step on that exact location without ro- actually looking at without it. actually looking directly at it so, so it's you, very it's so intense like try it's getting a robot like- to, to, to 
walk down a rock face with a bunch of these individual rocks and you see how complex all the multiple systems come into play to make sure that we can actually get from point A to point B without falling on our face. Exactly. It's like the visual system is always, basically it's meant to be one step ahead of the game and it's seeing what is to come, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's why like even when we're doing the beam work, it's like looking into the distance is very natural. Even if you're walking down a sidewalk, Mm -hmm. you're naturally gazing 10 feet down the road just to see what's coming up, right? And like you say, you're not actually looking at every single step you take. Now, if you're on some surface that you really don't trust, then that's when you might have to look directly at your feet. Yeah. But if you're on a surface that's somewhere in the middle, that that gaze, and it probably, I, I would say the safer the surface that you're on, the, the further you can get away with looking into the distance yep. without actually being aware of what's going on. Because you trust that I'm not going to run into this you know, weird changing environment. Yep. It's, I'm on a pavement, paved sidewalk. Nothing really crazy is going to happen unless I see it coming in the distance, right? And the better you get at training awareness of your feet, the less you have to rely on your visual system. That's one thing I'm finding yeah. out too is the more aware my brain is of my sensors at my feet, um, the less I have to look at what I'm doing. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that's just, you can prioritize what system you're training by weaning away from the other systems, whether that's closing your eyes or looking away or standing on something that has a lot of instability because that messes with your vestibular system too, right? Your yeah. body awareness and your visual system have to do more if you're standing on an unstable surface, which throws off all your, your kind of vestibular mechanisms. So let's talk a little bit briefly about the vestibular <laughs> system, what it is and, and how it contributes to balance. So that, yeah, the vestibular system is actually, when we learned this in school, I, I thought immediately it was, it was pretty crazy because <laughs> I know it flew right over my head. I was yeah. like, what the fuck is this? This is way too complex. So it's basically in your inner ear. So who would have thought your, your ear actually is a main component of your ability to sense where you are in space. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But within your ear, there's these deep canals. I don't want to get too deep into it. Uh, but there's this, there's this kind of three planes of motion, three canals. Yeah. They each have these little nuggets in them and the flow of those nuggets on the hairs of those canals determines the signals that go to our brain to tell us yeah. what plane of motion our, our, our skull is in basically. So these little, yeah, exactly. These hair cells, they call them. <clears throat> and what they do is they pick up the, the motion of this, this stuff, which is kind of swashing around in there, depending on where our head is and our body is in space. Um, and again, that's all firing to your nervous system, telling you where you are. So, um, basically you have this gyroscope effect where your body can tell, again, you can tell if somebody flipped you upside down when you're in the dark, if you were in a machine, you'd know you're upside down, you'd know exactly. kind of what angle you're at. And that's that natural sense of your inner ear. So what we find is that your visual system and your vestibular system work together and all these systems work together but there's something called the vestibular ocular reflex and what this is is it's like your your own gyroscope so whenever your head is moving in order to preserve the visual uh, feedback that you're getting your eyes will actually lock in on the object and they'll make the opposing movements to keep your eyes like centered on the actual object or on space that you're looking at. Hmm. So it's this weird kind of thing where wherever your head tilts, let's say your head tilts, tilts right 10 degrees, your eyes will tilt the opposite way 10 degrees to keep yourself focused on to whatever you're forward looking. gaze. Exactly. So that's happening at all times. If you're, you know, moving your head around in a circle, your eyes are actually still focused on whatever object you're, you're looking at. Mm-hmm. So it's like the most high tech gyroscope that we have in our, in our bodies. And that's how these systems start to work together to keep things in check. So when we talk about balance, there's three parts, vestibular, visual, proprioceptive. All those three systems are generating data points that get sent up to your brain. Your brain processes them and then will send out the right signals to fire the correct muscles to stop you from falling over. And this happens, I'm not sure the exact amount, I assume hundreds and hundreds of times per second. And the slower, the the more poor the computing of those data points is, or the slower those data points are in reaching your brain, the poorer your balance, right? If it takes you one second to compute data from your foot, that can be enough time for you to get out of your center of mass and and have to step out of your center of balance, right? If you're on mm-hmm. a beam. But if you're training, you know, when we're training balance, we're really doing, it's really neural training, right? You're not training the muscles to get stronger. You might be training some muscles to not fatigue as easily, but you're really training your brain at getting better at acknowledging these three systems and getting better and more efficient at processing the incoming data. And then expelling uh an like an output to correct your body position what you're doing exactly you're what, dialing your, your brain you're you're essentially stress testing these systems right mm-hmm. because you're trying to put them to the test um by stimulating these systems um, and getting them to work and do what they're supposed to be doing so if you think about like stress testing something we want to actually challenge it mm-hmm. and that's where training comes into play because training it is limit. stress testing so if you're looking at 
no, just put it this way. If you're looking at a blank screen or a computer screen all day, um, the same environment indoors, you're really not stimulating this visual system. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just one example of it. If you go out into a forest and you see, there's, you're in nature, there's running water, you're looking all around, you're stimulating all these things. I notice that my vision actually improves subjectively when I'm in a forest or I'm out on a hike. I can see a lot crisper and clearer when I'm actually looking at like millions of different stimuli as mm-hmm. opposed to like one computer screen in front of me for long hours at a time. And it makes perfect sense. You're literally flexing. Like when you put something into focus with your eye, you're flexing muscles in your eye that bend your lens to bring it into focus Mm -hmm. the less you flex like if you never flex your bicep your bicep gets weak and it disappears if you never flex your eye muscles to look at things that are far or complex in color or complex in pattern your eyes literally get worse at detecting those things Mm -hmm. so if all you do is look at a screen all day with pixels at a certain fixed range i i legitimately think i got rid of my need for glasses because i i didn't have a very big prescription but in like when we were in university i would have to wear them for longer um for bigger lecture halls because everything was fuzzy and the story of the human body talked about visual the visual um the vision system in humans and how it started to get shittier because we never looked at things that were far away so mm-hmm. whenever we go on a hike whenever i'm going out on a drive i literally make an effort to look at things that are extremely far into the distance and try to focus on these things and i think my eye muscles have gotten to the point where i don't need apart from like at night i really don't use glasses anymore and i i literally think i trained away some of that dependence uh, by just not constantly being look looking at a screen and actually forcing myself to look at things in the distance for certain periods of time like when we exactly. go on hikes and stuff like it's so that's uh, like i don't know it's shocking that's stress testing your your vision and then yeah and then your vision as it pertains to your balance if you're walking around you are incorporating some of that balance but stress testing the other two systems are are, are key too so again if you if you're walking around on a flat ground all day and you're never testing your your balance system as a whole mm-hmm. you're not going to be stress testing these systems um, to the extent that they're actually going to improve or even just be preserved and that's why we see so many people's sense of balance just deteriorates over the years and a big part of that is just simply not using it um, and not testing it or stressing Mm -hmm. it and then not getting better because of that Um, so and that's why we see these like the risk of falls these days for the elderly population is just incredible and it's getting like it's almost getting worse and worse and and falls are deadly like like i don't know i'm gonna butcher this stat but it's something like over the age of 75 having a fall and breaking a hip you have a 50 percent chance of being dead in the course of one year Mm -hmm. and i think that has more to do with the fact that when you fall and a fall is just you know without actually tripping on something you fall is an indicator that multiple systems are starting to fail or 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 not work as well um but that's insane you know like the fact that if you fall and break a hip in in a year you have a 50 percent chance of not being alive anymore like we need to work we need to look at these aspects like training balance which is a very low risk low threshold thing that anyone can do at some level right whether it's standing on one leg whatever it might be but if you're not moving you're not populating data from these three systems right if all you do is sit all day when you turn 80 and look at computer screens or um, you know play cards or play chess or whatever it is and you're not moving you're no longer populating these data sets your brain is getting worse at computing that data and so your balance starts to get shittier exactly and it's something that can be trained it's not i think you know, people think that when you get older, your body just gets shitty, you lose your balance, you start to get weak. That's a cop out because it doesn't have to be that way. It's no. your body literally. OK, maybe you can't put slabs of muscle on like you like you could when you were 20 and your testosterone level was high, but you can improve your muscle mass. Like we talked about this in the last podcast, you, you literally have massive amounts of time available later in your life. What better time to work on your body than then to make sure that it brings you to the next 20 years without you being in hospital or breaking down or dying? Exactly. You might not be at the peak performance of your your balance system, but you can still maintain that to a crazy degree if you work on it. And you see examples of that, Um, you know, but that's the thing is you're training not only your visual system, but that vestibular system and and also your neuromuscular system. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into that next. But uh, it's very, very trainable. It's that's the the whole point we want to make here is that um, it's, it's not a safety something. buffer. It's yeah. a buffer, right? It's a, you literally are have that extra little bit of capacity so that if you do trip on a curb or you do fall over a toy that your grandkids have, like that might be the having trained that or maintaining it can be the difference between you going down and snapping a wrist in half or you catching yourself because you've exactly. trained that system to be. So it's like that a safety buffer. Weekend, I, I was you remember I was out on that. Um, I was balancing on this this wooden piece. Um, this log and I actually slipped off when I wasn't even looking <laughs> and I just like landed right into a perfect stance. I was like, holy crap, like that was, it put me into check, but 
at the same time, I was like, that would have been an ankle sprain probably two years ago before I... And for most people, I honestly think for most people that that can be a severe injury. Yeah. Um, because I don't think they just have the... Re- you know, we train balance all the time because we actually enjoy doing it. But it really is something that you see the results of what you've been working on. When you do something like that, you slip on a slippery log and catch yourself with zero repercussions. You're like, shit, I think what I've been working on has allowed me to get to a point where I can recover from a slip like that without any problems. Exactly. Just one thing to note, I think I was just thinking about like the vestibular system and all of this like swashing fluid that's in our inner ear mm-hmm. stimulating these hair cells. Again, that's another system that if you think about it, a lot of people are just kind of like with the sedentary lifestyle, they're not stimulating this whole system too. Mm-hmm. Um, you think about somebody who does more, you know, an extreme sport or even something. I know there's a lot of people these days jumping on trampolines to stimulate a bunch of different things like the lymph system, but that would also stimulate um that vestibular system, just putting your body into different orientations in, in sure. space. Um, and I think there's not as people don't do as much activity that would stimulate this anymore, putting your body in weird positions, weird orientations. And this is also all giving you, it feels weird when you're like, everyone knows the feeling of trying to, to do like a flip when you're younger off a, off a diving board or something. It feels mm-hmm. weird to be in different positions, but mm-hmm. you get used to it and you get a feel and what you're doing is you're directly influencing that system too. So more activities that stimulate that, even in small ways, like jumping mm-hmm. on a trampoline, doing a balance beam, slack line yep. will all improve that. And you see like, you see outliers. I, I had a lady that I treated once and she lived on the river and she, um, did stand up paddleboarding basically every day. She's retired. Mm-hmm. She did stand up paddleboarding every day. I put her on her beam and she crushed it way better than a 15 year old kid, a 20 year old active adult. Like she nailed it. And it was, her system just stayed tuned and she was constantly training those systems. She just liked paddleboarding. She didn't know what paddleboarding did, but it's literally one of the best hip stability movement balance exercises you can do because it requires this fine, but fine, um, kind of equality between having good stability and having good power output because if you're not able to connect your systems you can't generate power from the tip of the paddle down to your feet and you have to be able to integrate your whole body in order to paddle board and not fall off mm-hmm. um so it's i mean these people seem like outliers but it's literally just a direct reflection of what they've been doing with their body and when you look exactly. at it in that respect you're like okay that's not surprising at all because i was shocked when i saw it on the beam and i was like what the hell's going on here how are you that good on something you've never tried before and then i remembered she said when i was um doing her subjective at the start i was like okay she paddle boards every day. This makes perfect sense. Exactly. And it's all transferable. A lot of this stuff is very transferable. And sometimes it just takes, it's very, very interesting when you see the, the tuning effect that happens. So if like, for instance, I'm on a beam mm-hmm. and I'm doing like half an hour beam work and then I jump on a slack line, right? The first minute of it, you're like, Whoa, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. But then you tune in right away onto that because again, I've experienced somebody who's never tried a slack line. It's different, but you, you just tune right in. And the same thing would be on a paddleboard, same idea. Mm-hmm. So it, it's all transferable and it, it's just a slightly different proprioceptive environment, I would mm-hmm. say, because you're different already tuning, input. different input, slightly different input that you have to tune into. But then, but then again, you, you're, it's familiar too. It's like, mm-hmm. I've been here before. Um, but it, it's very interesting because it, it's like tunable to the, to the second almost. And it just takes you a, a couple deep breaths and then you're back in the zone again. Mm-hmm. So, so let's, let's talk about, so we talked about balance, the three systems. Let's talk about why people lose their balance because a lot of, we get a ton of people in the clinic these days that even standing on one foot with their eyes open is a struggle. Like I had three assessments yesterday. No one could do, none of my assessments could do that for 10 seconds without falling, which is shocking because one of them was like a grade eight, a kid in grade eight. Another one was, um, I think it was about 50, but he sat all day for his job. And another one, I can't remember. But anyway, I just remembered at the end of the day yesterday thinking, well, how is it that people can't like not being able to balance on one foot for 10 seconds without falling is literally a, a safety risk. Like yeah. that's a big problem. And and so what are the things, what are the culprits that cause us to lose our sense of balance? I think two big ones that I'm focusing on a lot more now is number one, we put things on top of our feet that impede their ability to act like a sensor. So we, mm-hmm. I always assess people barefoot. Uh, well, everyone in the clinic does. Um, but if your foot's not used to being able to sense the ground, it can't take in that data as well. If your foot's always sitting on a, uh, an air bubble or a piece of cushioning or is in a shoe that doesn't allow any articulation or, or pressure sensing on the bottom of the foot and all these, you know, the foot has the same sensory distribution as like our lips and our hands or somewhere close to that. So it's designed to take in a huge amount of info. Um, so feet mess up our, our, our shoes rather mess up our feet 
being able to access sensors. And then the other one is just the fact that people sit all day, develop a hip imbalance, and aren't able to get into the right position to actually recruit these important stabilizers. That's what I was going to say. So we've already talked about like, and the, that feet, the feet would be us not being able to get in the sensory information to mm-hmm. be able to, and the, and same thing with the, with the vision and the vestibular. So mm-hmm. those two systems just not being trained, just just, just like basically not, never being challenged, never being challenged. Um, and I would argue that the feet not being able to be challenged or not being able to pick up this input. The other part of the equation is after you actually have, let's say you have a sensory rich environment, mm-hmm. then it's a matter of like, do you have the stability and strength to actually be able to do something about it? Right. And that's the other part of the equation. So even if you're getting all this reach feedback from your feet, we take somebody's shoes off. It's like, why can they still not stand on their feet? Mm-hmm. First of all, they're not used to using that information. Second of all, they can't, they can't get control of their joints. They can't get their joints into a good position so that they can actually make proper adjustments. So, mm-hmm. so really that's kind of that control in the presence of change, that stability concept. Um, and again, a, a big part of that is like a big part of that is strength. A big part of that is mobility. And the, and the interplay of all these things, right? So you're t- saying like, if your hips are tight, if you can't get your hip in a good position to access all of the muscles around it, mm-hmm. if you can't get that joint centrated middle of the socket, then you're not gonna be able to use it efficiently to actually create these micro adjustments muscularly to keep you balanced, regardless of the information that you're getting. Yeah, it's positional inhibition. If your joint can't get into the right, like prerequisite position to get all those, to recruit all those muscles, like you said, you can't use them. And so you're putting yourself at a serious disadvantage and it's not just, Oh, my balance is shit. It's if you spend six hours or more sitting per day, which is extremely easy. And most people are closer to 10 hours when you actually delve into how much sitting they do. And you're not doing something to offset every hour that you spend sitting, your hip is stuck in a forward position. It's not a question of if it's a question of how badly is it stuck there and how much work do you have to do to get it back? And I don't care if you're a 10 year old kid because you have a desk job and you're gonna have a desk job for a while. High school, school is a desk job. It really is as much as people like to say, oh yeah, we move around or whatever, we have recess. Yeah, you sit all friggin' day for the most part. Um, if you're, if, and if you put your hip in flexion all day, you're not gonna be able to extend. You're not gonna be, most people can't even get to neutral. If you can't get to neutral, you cannot recruit the stabilizers at your hip. And so exactly. like that's problem number one is reestablish at least enough mobility to be able to repattern some of these stabilizers because you're you at don't a disadvantage, do that first, right? Exactly. You, you can't, you're at a disadvantage if, cause you're still gonna be able to maintain your balance to some extent. It's just a matter of like how, how energy expensive is it to do and how efficient is it? So mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, you're not going to fall over in space, but if you're having trouble just controlling your, your foot and preventing yourself from standing on one foot, because you can't use the appropriate muscles because you can't get in the appropriate position. Mm-hmm. That's something you, that's instantly workable. And it's just something that you, you maybe for in most cases that I see clinically, it's just, you need a little bit more hip mobility, mm-hmm. right? You need to just open up your hip joint, get access to it uh, and then train. And then again, it's just apply the stressor again. So put, put them in a situation where they can then use it. Yeah. So, Force them, put them in engineer their environment so that after they open up that mobility, they're forced to rewire and repattern the important stabilizers. And mm-hmm. it's not, That's where this beam stuff comes in because it's not an auditory cue that's going to do that. It's not, okay, I want you to fire (laughs) your gamellis. I want you to fire uh, this muscle or that muscle. It's No, it's stand on this beam, don't look down, don't fall off. And after five minutes of that, you're going to be firing more of those muscles if we've done the right work to free up and open up your hip. And it's, it's one of these things where it's like, and it's other so joints are basic too. and simple. And the position, it's funny when you see someone balance, the position they often collapse into um, or, or fail towards is valgus, is their knee collapses inward, mm-hmm. which is a source of tons of knee problems that we see. Their foot collapses so that the arch falls to the ground, which is you know this whole flat foot epidemic. Um, it all has to do with not being able to generate torque at your hip because your hip is stuck in a forward position. Yeah. So it's that's that's something we harp on, like probably the the biggest topic of conversation in our seminar, the biggest single topic is hips, because that's really where a lot of this stuff comes from. Why? Because we all sit more than we all overdose on sitting. It's so deep culturally in in our society now that we take it for granted because it's something that everyone just does, just like we take shoes for granted as something that everyone else that everyone does, but is literally the primary culprit for those two things are the main culprits for why everyone's breaking down, right? And we can break down in a multitude of ways, but the root cause oftentimes is feet and hip dysfunction in terms mm. of the lower body. And I would like there basically if you conceptually every every joint, like you need a prerequisite amount of mobility. Like the ankle I argue, is also massive in terms of your ability to balance. Mm-hmm. The ankle's also like 
if you look at the subtalar joint and the Taylor curl joint, it's working in that transverse plane. So it's able to make all these little adjustments as well and keep your, you stacked and centered. Mm -hmm. So that joint moving well is very important. Um, your hip is very important though, because if it's that naturally that ball and socket joint, it again is its own like kind of gyroscope. So if it's working well, it can make all these, like these, these little adjustments in, uh, infinite number of planes yeah right because these it's micro, by nature micro, and you see it when you get someone standing on a beam these micro adjustments where it's like tiny little fidgety movements and their brain is trying to discover how to fire the muscles in the right sequence to align all the jenga blocks right mm. if your ankle is if your foot's collapsed or your hips not centrated all your jenga blocks are kind of out of alignment so it doesn't matter how hard you try and train that until you put the jenga blocks in good alignment and allow yourself to posturally be in this kind of nice upright um, stacked position, it's gonna be very difficult. To and then it balance. clicks, and yeah. you'll see when people can finally figure out how to stack themselves, then it, it just clicks. In terms of like, first of all, they they have their balance there for them, like oh, I found it. But in their brain, it clicks. They're like, they this is how it. Their brain calibrated. Okay, this is the centrated position where we have the most joint um, stability, and now the muscles just have to do a tiny bit of work to stabilize it. Yeah. Whereas you know, it's kind of like balancing a stick on your hand. If you allow the stick to get really out of position, you got to move massive amounts to keep that thing up upright. Mm -hmm. If you keep the stick pretty much straight upright, you just have to make all these tiny little adjustments. And and the quicker you get at making those micro adjustments, the easier it is to balance that thing. It's effortless almost. So and it's you, like twofold, right? So it's can you actually achieve that position? I think that's the biggest limiting factor for people is because if you don't have that baseline level of mobility, you can't actually achieve that position that that clicks mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is if you do have that mobility, then it's just a matter of finding it and tuning your brain to find that position. So you can actually acknowledging that mobility. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a good way to get in. The next point is by training stability, you allow yourself to keep the mobility that you worked hard to reestablish. Mm -hmm. So if your hip is tight and you do 10 minutes of mobility work, you know, you're doing some 90, 90 or some hip extension work, to open up, you know, 10 degrees more of extension and getting rid of that clamp on the front of your hip that develops from 10 hours of sitting a day. If you don't teach your brain how to use that range or how to incorporate that range by rewiring some of those stabilizers that function in that extra 10 degrees of hip extension, your brain's a lot more likely to take that range right back from you. You haven't mm. earned the right to keep it. And so you end up having to start the next day by mobilizing all over again. And so it, it just makes your life easier by rewiring software right after you do the mobility work. And I think we've gotten good, um, much better in clinic now at, at partnering those two together to give people way longer term results, like, well, you know, less effort required to achieve better results. Exactly. You have to put in work wherever you want to attain that mobility and, and maintain that mobility. You just got to put in work there. Mm -hmm. Work it could be whatever you want it to be. It could be just getting into that, that bottom position of a squat if you're trying to maintain a squat and actually generating force there and tension there, right? Mm -hmm. It could be, be being on a balance beam and actually stacking your body and getting getting used to, you know, finding these little these little areas in your hip that you didn't, you weren't able to get in, you know, five minutes prior to that or last week, and just putting in time there. And mm -hmm. putting in time is working that system where it wasn't previously working. And that's what's going to make the benefit over time. Yeah. So let's talk about, um, so we won't get too deep into what mobility work you need to do in order to free up those joints. Well, that's maybe a conversation for another day, but let's talk about, you know, addressing the two main obstacles to getting balance back. So using your foot as a sensor, pretty simple, take your shoes off, wear shoes that are designed for human feet. Your foot automatically starts to act as a better sensor. It starts to be able to take in more information. The sole of your foot, the skin, where all the sensory um, receptors are can all of a sudden start to take in a lot more data than they used to. Number two, if sitting is the reason that's getting you in trouble in terms of hip stability, then start to slowly wean your dependence from sitting, offset the sitting that you do do. And when you do your hip mobility work, layer on some software. And that's what we want to talk about next is different ways to train balance. So, you know, our favorites in terms of the ones that we do frequently are working on a balance beam and a balance beam can be, you know, we sell these balance beams because we wanted to build the most badass, challenging balance beam that we could. But for the most part, a two by four of lumber is what I tell people to go get because it's accessible. Mm -hmm. It's easy to grab. Um, and it's something that you can make narrower as time passes to make it more challenging. Right. And then the that's a nice line. start for people. That's, a, nice, that's a great start. For what people. you're doing is taking away their, their base of support and making them go in line. Yep. Making so, them put one foot directly behind the other in a straight line and, yeah. and narrow their base of support. So that's a good way, playing around with their base of support. Yep. Um, and, and it's very non-threatening. You're two inches off the ground. So even somebody 
um, who's just getting into it or who is um, on the older side and is not used to that mm-hmm. or is fearful of some some of these balance challenges, start with that. And go barefoot. That's go a barefoot. Pretty, go bare. Whenever you're working on balance, go barefoot or else you're literally handicapping your ability to to train that system. And I would argue that anything you are training, balance is a component of that yeah. because it's a component of that stability. So the fact that you're not going barefoot anyways is, is is something you should be thinking about as well. So if you're doing a gym workout, there's also reason to be barefoot because mm-hmm. you're just you're just tuning these systems more. And balance has far deeper effects than what people might think. You know, I think balance is not a very sexy thing to work on. Um, and that's one thing we're trying to bring more excitement and more playful kind of aspect to training balance because that's what you need for people to be interested. But, you know, we get powerlifters in that, you get them standing on one leg or you get them on a beam and they can't stand for five seconds and yet they're squatting 400 500 pounds it doesn't you know one not having that stability is probably a risk factor for them hurting themselves or using the wrong pattern but two train their balance up which doesn't take very much time and they can add 50 pounds to their squat without any training load added like it's crazy balance better balance equals more resiliency less injury prone and it also equates to more performance. So it's, it's many exactly. things all You're in taking one. the brakes off. Your brain all of a sudden understands what's going on, knows how to stabilize that joint, and is going to be more permitting of allowing you to exert more strength or more power. Like it's, it really is, aside from sleep, I think this, one of the easiest and, and most accessible performance enhancers is um, improving your sleep and improving your stability and your balance. And so you just got to find a fun way to train it and do it consistently. Mm-hmm. It should be part of your training, right? Like it's, it's literally the CNS demand when you're doing beam work is tiny. It's near zero in terms of how much energy that's going to take up you know, take away from your workout, but the amount of benefit you can garner from that by just tuning your hips and, and getting some of that stability back before you load your body up with a bunch of weight. Um, it's, it still shocks me whenever I hear stories or whenever I see people work on this stuff, even though it shouldn't, but it makes sense. Exactly. Um, so other ways you can train it starting with a two by four, bringing it up to like some sort of rounded surface. That's where the beam comes into play. Mm -hmm. So again, any type of beam, um, the beams, the TFC beams are 1.5, 1.5 inch, inch diameter. diameter. Yeah. So that's typically a nice way to allow your foot to actually grip the beam itself and have to stabilize and work. Um, and it splays your metatarsals. Like when yeah. your foot cups around it, you're literally opening up all the metatarsals, which are so used to being compressed in a shoe that it, it helps prevent things like Morton's and aroma and just helps to kind of reestablish a, a wider base of support, a wider foot. Exactly. And you can play around with other surfaces too. Like I'll go and balance on like wooden fence posts and stuff mm-hmm. like that, that are circular as well. And that might be two and a half, three inches in diameter. It's just a whole different ball game. You, your foot can work to grip a little bit less. You have to rely on your hip a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. So just different, different surfaces. Stimulus. Yeah. And like literally go on a walk in a park, you'll find tons mm-hmm. of different surfaces. Once you start looking for balance beams, they're everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Going on a hike great way to actually challenge your overall system yep. so you're especially if you're on a hike like we were on so uh rocks at different angles different mm-hmm. sizes different shapes uh, as opposed to some like flat gravelly ground uh, mm-hmm. and that'll just really even though the flat gravelly gr- the gravelly ground will still challenge it but something that puts your ankle your foot uh your hip in different positions like every little uh, literally every step you take mm-hmm. and that's going to really challenge the robustness of your entire system and let your so. foot work let your foot interpret more of the environment wear a shoe with less cushioning less rigidity less no support you know mm-hmm. these vibrams this foot glove that you put over your foot to protect it from damage but allow all the sensory richness to come in are so powerful and like no one gives a shit what you're wearing when you're on a hike okay you have yeah. to care less about what your shoes look like so just get something that allows you to get the full experience from a hike from your you know get the full experience of of the environment around you instead exactly. of just putting blindfolds on your feet and then you know putting yourself at higher risk of injury, but you're just taking away from the experience, right? Like every small sensory input that I get into my foot is activating certain areas of my brain. And, you know, without going too deep into it, I I really think that this plethora of mental, um, like these neurodegenerative diseases that people are getting in old age, like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or all these kind of things, dementia, is really because their brain's not getting used, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. And that's a component of that. And just go barefoot, you light up your brain like crazy. Yeah, there's there's many cases. I read this uh, this book, The Brain's Way of Healing, and there's there's cases of Parkinson patients who actually reverse their symptoms or control their symptoms just through moving and, and stimulating their movement system in different ways. So and it, and there was one particular guy that actually he tried to be very vocal about it, 
and he was kind of shunned and shut down. He is actually able to get off all his Parkinson's medications just through daily movement practice, daily walks, wow. daily environmental walks. And again, he's like, hey, I, why I'm is just, he shunned? Why are people so resilient to this stuff? That's a whole bag. That's a bag of worms to open. But the the big the weird thing. But that was the whole part of the story. Is that like he was actually having resistance from from doctors, from pharmaceutical companies, obviously, crazy um, things like that. But saying like, and then they even said, "Oh, you didn't even have. We don't think you had full." Parkinson's then right after he did all this work and then his original doctor's like no he did have full Parkinson's like I've been following <laughs> him for for many years he for sure did have it anyways that's something to you know that's the end scale of things we're not saying it's the only contributor to that but it's a, it is a big contributor to that if you stimulate this whole movement system more regularly in this balance system um, some of these neurodegenerative diseases are are less likely to happen over time. And again, For we're sure. not putting numbers on them. Uh, and we're not saying that's the only thing, but that's a, that's it's a, a component. Factor. It's a factor. It. And it makes logical, rational sense, right? We're not mm -hmm. saying that's the solution. We're not saying that guy's not an outlier and that everyone's going to get those results, but there's probably something to it. Like maybe let's pay attention to it a little bit more yeah. than just shunning it as bullshit. Like and just say, just, take this medication for the rest of your life now, yeah. because that's the only thing that's going to help. So, and a side note, I was listening to a Chris Kresser podcast. The top 10 prescription medications in the United States are lifelong prescriptions. How crazy is that? What kind of, this is a crazy world. It's a crazy time we're living in right now. Like I'm excited to see where, where the next 10 years go because shit is as wacky as I think it can get right now. Um, that's sorry. That was a tangent. <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the same type of thing. That's the best business model there is. Yeah get someone on something at a young age and have them be a lifelong customer. It's like take the McDonald's strategy and apply it to drugs. And it's crazy lucrative at the expense of a lot of people's health. Exactly. Um, so but anyway, just getting back to ways to, to train it up, um, you know, bilateral the, ways too, like these wobble boards, this revolution board, all this kind say. of stuff. That's a nice one too. Um, although there's something to be said with having something that forces you to be unilateral for certain points. Cause I yeah. really think that, putting yourself on one leg on an unstable surface, there's something powerful to having to do with that mm -hmm. as something that's separate than doing two legs. But those are, those are just, those are fun stimulus. Yeah. To play with too. any of those balanced toys and tools, uh, like Indo the indoor boards, boards yeah. the, uh, and then we can talk about slack lines too, cause that's something we've gotten into recently. So it's just kind of bringing things up a notch. You're having to make these micro adjustments a lot quicker. And you'll see that when somebody gets the, the stanky leg when they step on it in the first place, <laughs> you'll see their leg just shaking side to side uncontrollably and they can't calm it down. Um, but once you learn how to actually make, start making these adjustments in a, in a slightly differ, different, uh, environmental demand then uh you really tune it in again and you can slow things down calm things down and walk pretty fluidly after you get used to it um and that you can take that all the way into like 100 foot lines and and different types of things so it's like really endless the possibilities that you can you can choose from but just something start somewhere and yeah. then start with something that progress from you that slightly beyond your capability that has a low risk of injury um and just watch your stepwise progression as you start to train these systems Back to the the stanky leg is a very interesting phenomenon because when you understand what interplay is actually causing that, so just to be clear visually, the stanky leg is where is what we call when someone steps on a slack line and they uncontrollably wobble side to side like super super fast and it almost looks like their leg is having a seizure. And when you understand what's going on there, they're just it's usually people that aren't used to using a slack line their body is trying to adjust to their foot getting out of position, but it overcompensates, adjusts too far on the other side, and then there's a small delay on the readjustment, and it just goes back and forth. So it's not, too, the system isn't tuned. It doesn't know how hard to stabilize with certain muscles. It doesn't know how much force to exert. It doesn't kind of recognize how much movement is happening. So it's very, and very quickly, those people go to the point where they can calm down, they breathe, they relax, yeah. they tune the system, and... The system you know, is almost like it's very quick, how, freaking out at first, and yeah. it's making these crazy adjustments. It's like, oh shit, I'm going one way. Like, like put on the the gas to go the other way. Boom, exactly. boom, boom, boom. I know it's so and crazy. Then, then it's like, <laughs> but and hilarious. again, a part of that is like global relaxation. But w once you're able to kind of finally relax your body through some deep breathing and then and tune your system in all the proprioceptors and 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 the visual too. Like we, those people, like when I started slacklining, I didn't know where to look. Mm -hmm all these systems start being trained up and then everything calms right down and you can make these you just practice yeah it can be effortless looking after that so yeah anyway that wraps up what we're uh, doing for episode number three so hopefully that give you guys a little bit more insight as to um, what balances the systems that are involved why it's important how to train it 
how to regain the mobility to actually be able to train these stabilizers. Um, and hopefully you can incorporate that in both your, your own physical practice, um, using it for injury prevention and also performance, but also help out any patients that you might treat um, on the health professional side if you're a health professional listening to this. Uh, thanks for listening to episode number three of Shop Talk. We'll be back next week with episode number four. Haven't determined what topic it's going to be yet, but uh, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening.